In the history of rock part one, we talked about the development of the singer-songwriter model, or the idea that um, a, somebody, that, 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 I guess we talked about it under the idea of authenticity in rock music, and we talked about it with regard to mid-period Beatles uh, with Bob Dylan, and, and the idea that when you write a song, the lyrics should be about something important and and serious-minded, and they shouldn't just be about I want to hold your hand or she loves you, yeah, 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 or that kind of thing. Um, that, that Dylan, in many ways, kind of led the charge in that direction. He came out of the folk tradition, so the lyrics had always been important in the folk tradition. Remember, one of the critiques against Dylan was that he took the we of folk music and turned it into the me of the singer-songwriter style, sort of navel-gazing, thinking about his own thoughts as opposed to the, you know, the kind of problems of people in society and socioeconomic and political injustices and this kind of thing. Anyway, that's, that's the basis for the singer-songwriter style that we talk about in the early 1970s. People like Dylan, uh, the Beatles, especially by the time the Beatles get to the very end of their careers, the White Album, um, Abbey Road, they're, they're acting a lot more like singer-songwriters, each one, John, Paul, uh, and George. The uh, thing about the um, singer-songwriter tradition is what I call the importance of being earnest. That is, you have to create the impression of sincerity and personal expression. It's very important that what you're saying be understood by the listener as something that you know you really think or you've really experienced or that you really resonate with. Um, there's a, there's, it's, it's kind of a very earnest and serious-minded kind of style. But the also important thing about it is that nothing should get in the way of the link between the singer and the listener. So no fancy arrangements that sort of take the listener's attention away. No extended guitar solos. No cool new sort of synthesizer sounds or things like that that come into the picture. None of that. Uh, what, what, what it should be instead is just the illusion that the singer is connecting directly with the audience, correct, connecting directly with the listener. And the instruments that are sort of mixed you know, sort of forward in, in, in the production are the acoustic guitar, because an acoustic guitar says simplicity, it's wood, or the acoustic piano, right? Not so much the kind of synthetic sounds of, as we had in progressive rock, like the Moog synthesizer or the Mellotron or some of those other kinds, and certainly not bombastic arrangements. So it really starts to, it's really very much about the song, the sincerity, and the performance of it with the lyrics and the vocal uh, very much up front. So let's go through a couple of the singer-songwriters from the 70s, both the Americans and the British. I, I, again, as I said before in these videos, I know I may leave out some of your favorites here, but think of these really as representative examples. And if you've got favorites you want to talk about, bring them to the discussion forum where we'd love to hear uh, what you have to say and what you think about these things. Let's start with James Taylor, who starts out in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, but is signed to Apple Records and brings out one album with Apple in 1969 simply called James Taylor. Um, it's, James Taylor is important because he gives us a, a, a direct connection, a new artist with a direct connection back to the late 1960s, the Beatles, Apple. As you recall from uh, the, the first part of the class, uh, things with the Beatles and Apple were kind of crazy at the end of the 60s and they really couldn't do very much for him. But that album, that first album, James Taylor, uh, has two tracks on it that, that, have, uh, that are interesting to us. Carolina On My Mind, because that became a sort of classic uh, track for James Taylor, and a song called Something In The Way She Moves, which George Harrison liked enough, <laughs> at least liked the title enough, to use in his song from Abbey Road, Something, right? Uh, but after he left, after James Taylor left Apple, he went to Warner Brothers and had fantastic success with a number three hit in 1970, Fire and Rain, uh, and a number one hit, You've Got a Friend, 1971, a song written by Carole King, and it's Carole King that we'll turn next. Carole King, as you may recall from the first uh, uh, History of Rock, part one, uh, was one of the most important songwriters in the Brill Building in the first half of the 1960s, along with her husband, Jerry Goffin. Wrote a whole slew of hits, probably the most important one being Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow, uh, Chains, all kinds of tunes that Carole King wrote, hit after hit after hit. Then went through kind of a dry spell when things moved from, the focus moved from New York to L.A. She wrote some songs actually for the Monkees. I think Pleasant Valley Sunday was a Goff and King tune. But then reemerges as a singer-songwriter at the end of the 60s into the 1970s, interestingly, with the encouragement of James Taylor, who's telling her, no, you can sing your own songs, because remember, she had not been a singer or a performer before. And so he's telling her, no, you can sing your own songs. He, of course, does. You've got a friend. 
She does a debut album, but it's that second album, Tapestry, which is just a classic album in, in, in any way that you can think about it, not just for a woman, for a female singer-songwriter, for any singer-songwriter. Uh, the album is number one in 1971. It has a double A-sided single, It's Too Late, I Feel the Earth Move. Both of those songs went to number one. It's a fantastic record from beginning to end. There's just not a bad spot on it. Um, and really establishes Carole King as one of the most important singer-songwriters and a very influential figure for young female singer-songwriters who look to Carole King as somebody who, re as a woman who really can succeed on her own terms in the music business. And so her success will have a lot of ramifications for the future of the history of rock music. Somebody who's, who's uh, uh, history also goes back uh, into the 1960s is Paul Simon, who after leaving uh, Art Garfunkel, the, the breakup of Simon and Garfunkel, has his own uh, solo career uh, during the 1970s. Of course, Paul Simon had a tremendous amount of success in the second half of the 60s as, as one half of Simon and Garfunkel. So the roots in the 60s are very clear. Uh, if you want to hear some representative examples of what Paul Simon was doing in the first half of the 70s, I recommend the song Kodachrome from 1973, uh, which was a number two hit of his. An interesting couple interesting tidbits, tidbits about this. When he used the term Kodachrome um, as a kind of a metaphor for our memories and reality and the differences between the way we remember things and the way they really were and all those kinds of things, the Kodak company, um, insisted that, it, that, that a, a tra it, it be acknowledged that Kodachrome was a trademark of the Kodak company. And because it was a trademark of the Kodak company, the BBC refused to play the song on the air because they thought they would be promoting a trademark, that it was like a, an advertisement, right? Uh, and so despite all that, it was still a number two hit in this, hit in this country in 1972. Another great one from 1973 is a track called American Tune which uses a Bach melody. Actually, I think Bach reworked, uh, was reworking the, the, the music of another Baroque-era composer. But nevertheless, this tune, American tune, is just absolutely a fantastically beautiful uh, piece of music and shows the tendency from a singer-songwriter to use bits of classical music uh, in their music, which is something we usually think of as having more to do with progressive rock. Um, and then, um, it's uh, uh, another good representative example is the tune Still Crazy After All These Years. Uh, it's the, um, the title track to the album uh, of the same name, which went to number one in 1975. 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover was the big hit off that album. Paul Simon got a Grammy for that album. And I, as, I, as the story goes, I think in his acceptance speech, thanks Stevie Wonder for not having released an album that year, which made it possible for him to win the Grammy. Uh, anyway, Paul Simon, uh, a, a songwriter who in many ways in the American Songbook sort of rivals people like Carole King and Bob Dylan as one of the great American songwriters uh, throughout the decades. Other American singer-songwriters that we should mention, and I'm sure I'll leave a couple out here, Carly Simon, uh, her track Anticipation from 1971, and You're So Vain from 1973, a track that it was, is, is about a boyfriend who is self-absorbed, and the whole question arose during the time, who was it that the, who was the boyfriend that she was talking about, You're So Vain? Was it Warren Beatty? Was it Mick Jagger? Oh, if it was Mick Jagger, that was especially delicious because she actually gets Mick Jagger to sing background vocals on the tune so she can say, I'll bet you thought the song was about you, and he's actually singing. Awesome, how much better does it get? She denied that it was about Mick Jagger, but other people have said, you know, it really was. People that knew that knew those people during that time. Harry Chapin, some great sort of introspective songs. Taxi from 1972, about a guy who meets a, a person from his past while he's a taxi driver. Um, and Cats in the Cradle, a song about uh, fatherhood and all the things that, that, the kind of bittersweet memories that go with that from 1974. Don McLean, a couple of big tracks from 1971 that he was especially acclaimed for. Vincent, a kind of a portrayal of artist Vincent van Gogh, and American Pie, which was sort of one of the most studied songs for a while there when it first came out because it has all these references to the history of rock music. So as students of the history of rock music, you ought to look up the lyrics of American Pie and see if you can find all the references to things that we talked about in History of Rock Part 1 in those lyrics. I'm sure you'll find somebody online who's giving you all the answers to that, so it shouldn't be too hard to look up. And then finally, we can say a word or two about Jim Croce. Um, 
who's Bad Bad Leroy Brown and Time in a Bottle, both were, both were number one singles in 1973, A and B side of the same record. In the next video, let's take a look at the British singer-songwriters and the Canadian singer-songwriters as well.